All right, good morning, everybody. How's everybody doing out there? Ooh, that's kind of weak. We got to <laughs> we fill everybody up with a little more coffee. Welcome to day two of the Warfighter Summit. Uh, some tremendous panels yesterday, and I know a lot of folks had a chance to go around and see some of the great exhibits. Uh, and it uh, should be a great day today. We've got uh, three more fantastic panels, uh, one on innovation, uh, logistics, as we all know how key and current events showing how critical logistics is. And then we'll finish up with the uh, Sergeant Major of the Army. Uh, we'll give a, a presentation, then do a town hall uh, at the end of the day. So should be another great day. I do want to remind you the battle challenge uh, is open, and that's at the, uh, as you go out, it's at the last hallway down there, and there's some tremendous prizes. It is, it is open to the older folks here as well, but perhaps we should have had a, an age category. Hey, Sergeant Major, good to see you. I didn't see you there. Uh, and, uh, but, uh, but I would just highly encourage the Battle Challenge, some tremendous prizes, uh, top male, top female, the Battle Challenge down the hall. Well, we're starting off this morning, couldn't get any better than to have a tremendous warrior, uh, an individual who, uh, I don't even want to say like 41 years, going on 41 years of service, incredible service to our nation, uh, multiple deployments, Afghanistan, Iraq, and I found it interesting with a, former, a couple former 101st commanders uh, that uh, he holds a record for the longest uh, command of the 101st Airborne and uh, pretty, pretty awesome accomplishment there, that historic unit. Uh, but we're very fortunate to have the 40th Chief of Staff, the right leader at the right time, such a challenging time. And so if you would join me in a warm welcome to the 40th Chief of Staff of the Army, General James McConville. Hey, hey, good, hey, good morning. It, it, it's great to be here. See so many friends out. Uh, my classmate, um, captain of our basketball team at West Point, still, still could shoot the three pointers. And uh, it, it's great to be here with, with, with all of you. And, you know, you know, this is a great event. And I think it's appropriate to have a Warfighter Summit uh, right now with what's going on in the world. And I also think this is a very appropriate venue because we're, we're here at Fayetteville, we're here at Fort Bragg, we're here at Warfighter Town USA. Think about it. This is Warfighter Town USA because this is where the greatest units in the world, they live, they train, and they deploy from. And we've asked an awful lot of the troops from Fort Bragg over the last couple of years, over the last couple of decades, in fact, but as you all know, the 18th Airborne Corps is deployed right now under C.D. Donahue. The 82nd uh, just came back, Chris Leneve leading, leading that. And you know, for those in the 82nd, uh, we have deployed you four times, no notice, at least during my tenure in the last three years. And every single time, you have excelled. And then our Special Operations and Special Forces units under Brian Fenton and John Braga doing great things all around the world. Uh, they'll go unmentioned, but they don't go unappreciated because they, they make a huge difference in our national security. And then I want to give a shout out to uh, the North Carolina National Guard under Major General Todd Hunt. And like the rest of the Guard, they are doing, in, in our reserves, doing incredible things in the homeland and, and around the world. So we're very, very pleased to have them doing those type of things. And, you know, the Army can do a lot of things. You know, we can do covert, uh, COVID, we can do national disasters, you know, we can do driving school buses, we can go into hospitals. We can do a, a lot of things that the nation asks us to do. But that's not our really reason for being. The United States Army exists for really one purpose, and that purpose is to protect the nation by being ready to fight and win the nation's wars as part of the joint force. And that's really what it's all about. And, you know, sometimes we, we, you know, things go on that we may, you know, get away from that. But that's really why this conferences like this and war fighting is so important. And that's what we do. We are a war fighting organization. And we should never forget that because I would argue we live in very, very challenging times. And I'm not sure, at least my 41 plus years, that I've seen a more potentially dangerous time for our country and for our military. 
You know, take a look at what's, what, take a look at Russia. You know, in, in our national defense strategy, we, we now call them a, a, in an acute threat. Uh, I think the Ukrainians would call them something else. And, you know, they've conducted an unprovoked attack on the sovereign country of Ukraine. And we're seeing what's happening right there uh, as we speak. And, you know, as we talk to many of our European colleagues and allies, it was unimaginable not too long ago that we could have an unprovoked attack like this on the European continent. Unimaginable. And then we have to take a look at what's happening in Asia right now. Our pacing challenge, as, as the National Defense Strategy talks about, is China. And they have an economy nearly equal to ours, or depending on how you measure it, maybe larger than ours. But they're also building a world-class military to challenge us and to challenge the world order. And while you know, we're focused on China and Russia, we can't take our eye off of other persistent threats that are out there. North Korea is still a threat. Iran is still a threat. And the violent extremist threats have not gone away. And in some cases, they're actually getting worse. And then we look at the challenge of COVID. COVID's not gone. And as we look around the country, we're starting to get into the hurricane season. And we're going to probably see a lot of nat natural disasters that we are going to have to respond to, just like we've done in the last couple of years. So it's going to be a very, very busy time uh, for our military and, and, and for our Army. And, you know, that's not the only thing we're doing is making sure we're ready to fight today's fights. We also have to be ready for tomorrow's fight. And that's why, as all these other things going on, I'm just so proud of our Army because we continue to advance in the Army's greatest transformation in over 40 years. As we move from decades of counterinsurgency and counterterrorism and irregular warfare to large-scale combat operations. And for many of our leaders, this is, a, this is an inflection point. It's a major shift in how we do business. You know, counterinsurgency, counterterrorism, uh, irregular warfare, they're not going away. But the biggest threat is large-scale combat operations. And it's a good thing that we started transforming when we did, because when crisis hit our allies and partners in Europe this year, we were ready. Our army, our military was ready. First of all, we had a strong, permanent and rotational presence in Europe through our, through our troops that are assigned to U.S. Army Europe and U.S. Army Africa. And we, if many of you know, we have elevated U.S. Army Europe Africa to a four-star commander under General Chris Cavoli, who just became SAC Ur and UCOM commander, which is very, very helpful. And then uh, General Darrell Williams just took over as U.S. Army Europe Africa commander, and very blessed to have him at the reins. <laughs> and having a four-star commander in Europe really matters. It makes a difference to our allies and partners, and it makes a difference to our potential adversaries. And when you think about it, when was the last time that we had two corps in Europe? You know, as you all know, 18th Airborne Corps is deployed there. We also stood up the new 5th Corps. They are there actively involved in working with our allies and partners, reassuring them uh, and in conducting support operations in, in that, that our Ukrainian um, colleagues absolutely need. And also, we've got two divisions. As you all know, 82nd was over there, just replaced by the 101st. First Infantry Division is over there. And we have six brigade combat teams, including uh, one from the 82nd that was just there that was just replaced by the 101st, two combat aviation brigades. So for some of the older folks who have been around, we haven't had this type of structure in Europe in a long time, in a long time. But because of some of the things we've put in place, because of the readiness of our units, we're able to rapidly get there and, and, and be ready to stand by our allies and partners. And as many of you know, that you know, the 101st just went back uh, first time they've been back to Europe in over 80 years to relieve the 82nd. And so we talk a lot about the future fight and modernizing to be ready tomorrow. But in a lot of ways, we can learn many lessons 
from our transformation of what's happened in Ukraine right now. And if you study the history of our Army, our senior leaders did the same thing during 1973. They took a look at the Arab-Israeli War, and that helped them <clears throat> inform how we're going to fight coming out of the Vietnam War. And I would argue we're doing the same thing right now. Lots of lessons to be learned about what's happening in Ukraine, you know, what your our doctrine works, what your our weapons systems work, and, and we're going to take advantage of that and gather the lessons that we need to go ahead and set the Army on the right path for the future. You know, when you think about it, 1973 gave us early in battle. And it took us about 17 years in 1990 to actually validate the weapon systems we brought in, the doctrine we brought in, and we'll do the same thing coming out of 22-23 for the Army of 2040 that some of you will be around uh, to fight. And we're going to use it to refine multi-domain operations. And because we know, and we're seeing it right now, we're not just going to be con contested in the land, we're going to be contested in space, we're going to be contested in cyber, we're going to be contested in the air and, and, and in the sea, and we've got to be able to operate in that environment, and we're certainly going to be able to do that. And our doctrine will be coming out uh, FM 3.0 uh, right around October, November time frame, you know, so we can get after that. And we have something that our troops can work on. But many of you are working that already. You're not waiting for the doctrine to get in place. You're actually helping us develop it, and we are very, very appreciative of that. And that's being our use in our warfighter exercises already. You know, we're learning a lot about command and control nodes. Uh, you know, many of us had large command and control stationary nodes when we were in Afghanistan and Iraq. You know, company uh, op centers had stadium seats, you know, big screens, big tents. They were very stationary, and, and quite frankly, uh, they weren't very mobile. But what we're learning is our C2 nodes in this future fight have got to be small, and they've got to be mobile. And if they're not, they're not going to survive. And we need to be able to operate in, in a different way. We have to be able to operate in isolated and dispersed environment. And as I said before, we need to, we, we, you know, things that we depend on, you know, communications are probably going to be jammed. Uh, we have to be able to operate where we may not have position navigating timing. We can expect to be contested in every single domain and we're going to have to fight in those domains. We're going to see that long-range precision fires are going to be critical for the future fight. We're seeing that already in Ukraine with HIMARS, and, and quite frankly for us, that is not long-range fires. Not quite that. They're our number one modernization priority, and what we are doing right now, and we're getting informed from Ukraine and some other places, uh, Project Convergence, is how we're going to tie sensors to shooters throughout the battlefield. And that is what is going to give us the speed, uh, range, and convergence to have decision dominance on the battlefield of the future. And it's making a difference right now. And we're seeing that, that play out uh, in, 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 in some ways in Ukraine right now. We are developing a prison strike missile system that's going to go greater than 500 kilometers in the future, be able to sink ships. We're testing right now our, our mid-range capability, SM6s and Tomahawks, that again is going to be able to sink ships at thousands of kilometers. And we're, in fact, I was just out at Joint Base Lewis McCord uh, Tuesday and had a chance to see our hypersonic uh, battery that's in place right now. And we're in the final steps of having that capability by next year. But the equipment is there. It's C-17 trans portable, uh, the commanders are there, the multi-main task force is there, they're all bringing together that capability, they're building uh, the airplane, if you will, while we're flying it, and they're doing some great work out there to give us those capabilities that we're going to need in the future. And I can see a future where the Army can assist, assist in providing land-based, no-fly, and no-sail zones based on the capabilities we have as another option for our combatant commanders. And that's really what, our, what all of our modernization efforts are about, providing multiple options for the joint force and multiple dilemmas for our adversaries. You know, look at the evolution 
of drone technology on really both sides of the battlefield. And I argue, you know, when we talk about lethal drones and air launched effects and some of the capabilities that we see out right now, that is going to be one of our biggest threats on the battlefield. And we're going to have to deal with that. And, you know, we are aggressively getting after counter UAS. And when I talk to industry, and many industries here, you know, we're looking for innovative solutions to get after uh, lethal drones on the battlefield because they're going to be a threat from vile extremists all the way up to great powers. When we take a look at uh, Nagorno-Karabakh, when we take a look at what's happened in Ukraine, when we take a look at what's going on in Iraq and Afghanistan and, and Syria and, and other places, lethal drones are a threat to our troops and we want to develop those capabilities that can protect our, our soldiers on the battlefield. I see it very, very similar to the early 2000s when we started to see an ID threat on the battlefield. You know, we set up an ID task force. Uh, in fact, General D Dan Allen was one of the first that, that got after those type things that's sitting here. And uh, we're going to see the same thing with counter UAS. We just want to move much, much quicker. And so we're doing a lot of amazing and exciting things with technology and, and, and modernization. In fact, you know, we have 24 signature systems that you're going to see coming into your units very shortly. You know, some of you are involved in mobile tech to fire, the light tank, however you want to describe that. You all had a, had a hand in that. That's going to be coming in to start coming into our forces uh, next year. Um, you know, what we're doing with uh, the IVAS, the night vision goggles, what we're doing with next generation weapon, all these systems, uh, along with our long range precision fires, are going to start hitting units uh, next year. And we are very excited about that because that's what is going to give us the, the credible combat capabilities that we need. That's what's going to give us the ability to maintain the edge in warfighting, which we are all about. And, but the thing about warfighting, it's not just new equipment. In fact, the most important part of warfighting are the soldiers that do it. You know, I like to say that majors talk about grand strategy and general talk, generals talk about squads. And I, I see the side major up here right now because we talk a lot about squads. What you learn is you can't execute strategy, you can't execute plans unless you have great squads, platoons, and companies because they are the ones that actually do it. And, you know, we are, in some ways, we're transitioning back to, or we're transitioning really forward to a division-centric army. And we're doing that because the type of fighting that we're going to do is on a much bigger battlefield. The type of fighting we're going to do is going to be very, very complex over distances that, quite frankly, that the type of capabilities we're going to need go beyond a brigade combat team-centric army that worked very, very well uh, occupying and fighting in battle spaces in some of the areas that we saw. But the type of capabilities we're going to have, the ranges that we're going to deal with, um, quite frankly, call for divisions and even corps to be critical parts of what we're going to be doing uh, in, in the future. But having said that, we still need great small units. They are the ones that are going to do it. And that's why we spend a lot of time, at least the Sergeant Major and I do, and I know the Force Comm Commander talking about foundational readiness, making sure that we give our troops the time to develop uh, small units and individual soldiers that are masters of their craft through deliberate practice and, and through expert coaching. And, you know, if you think about it, you know, the, the, the most elite fighting forces throughout, the, throughout history, around the world, that's what they all have in common. They're masters of their craft. They're really good at the basics. And, you know, sometimes we want to move quickly through that and get to brigade and and division type operations. Uh, but we gotta give we gotta give our troops the time at the lowest levels to become masters of of of, of, of their weapon systems and masters of their craft. And you know for us in the army, you know the number one priority is people. And you know what that all means we talk about people first is is building cohesive teams that are highly trained, they're disciplined, they're fit and fight, they're fit and they're ready to fight and win. And that's what we want all you that are leaders out there to be able to do is build cohesive teams, they're highly trained, they're disciplined, and they're fit, and they can fight and win. 
But it also means giving our people the time and resources, which we want to do to become masters of their craft. It means implementing the best talent management systems uh, to get the right people in the right job at the right time. You know, all you have to do is take a look at the Russian forces in Ukraine to see what happens when you don't invest in high quality people, when you don't have a professional non-commissioned officer corps, when you don't have junior leaders and soldiers who can use mission command and operate off commander's intent. You can have some of the world's best warfighting capabilities, but, there's not, but they are not worth much if you don't invest in the actual war fighters. You know, after Russia invaded Ukraine, I traveled to Europe, and I've had a chance to visit our troops, and some of the, you, were, you were over there in Germany, Poland, Lithuania, Latvia, and Estonia. And then I was back a couple weeks ago meeting with all the chiefs, or my, my counterparts, about 36 of them uh, in Germany. And I can tell you I was really proud because they had great praise for the American soldier. It was really, for me, pretty unbelievable. You know, it, it, it's often been said, you know, where the American soldiers go, freedom follows. I would say right now that in this case, you know, where the American soldiers go, freedom stays. And every one of those countries wants our soldiers over there working side by side with them. They are reassured by our presence. They appreciate us being there. They want to, they want us, uh, they want us side by side with their soldiers. And so, so all the soldiers that have been over there truly appreciate how you represent our nation, how you represent our military, how you represent our army. And what I've learned is there's no substitute for the presence of American soldiers on the ground. You can be in the air, you can be off for sure, but I would argue there's no substitute for having American soldiers on the ground. When it comes to reassuring our allies, deterring our adversaries or bringing order to chaos. And it truly makes a difference. And you know, one of the things that we should not, and I need your help on, is take for granted the all-volunteer force. You know, people are our number one priority. That's what makes us great. And you know, we're in a very challenging period right now. And quite frankly, we put out a call to service to the entire Army and across all our components. Uh, because we got to continue to recruit and retain the world's greatest soldiers. And I'm asking every one of you, and I'm asking, you know, uh, especially our soldiers for life out there, to go ahead and, and help us inspire other young men and women to serve. And, you know, tell our soldiers stories, tell your story, tell about the United States Army as a pathway to success, and that there's really, in my eyes, no other place where you can serve with the world's greatest people and climb to the highest ranks no matter where you came from. And, you know, I often ask people why they chose to serve. And one of the best responses I've ever heard came from a soldier in the 82nd Airborne Division who said, I didn't want to get to the end of my life and realize I had made an impact. And I can tell you that that started made an impact, that started made an impact at H. Kaya and very, very proud of what that sergeant has done for our nation. So, you know, as we take a look at our soldiers and their families, you know, we want to do all we can to keep them with us. Um, and the other thing I would add is, you know, when our soldiers do decide to leave after honorable service, um, you know, thank them for what, for their service. Thank, send them off as a soldier for life in a dignified way that makes them want to inspire others to serve and uh, in, in what's going on with that. And, you know, there's some talk, and I can take some questions on it, on what's going on with recruiting and standards. And I can tell you right now, um, for us, quality is more important than quantity. We are not going to lower our standards. In fact, we're putting programs in place for those who want to serve that can't meet standards we're going to actually put a future soldiers prep course. It's going to start in August where, where young men and women who, who meet all the criteria except they, they either can't meet the physical criteria, they can't make the academic criteria, they'll get a 90-day prep program. If they meet the standards at the end of that program, uh, they can come in and serve. They can enter initial military training. 
If they don't, we're going to send them home and say, come on back and try it again. So we're not going to lower standards because we believe, you know, that we need the best quality soldiers in the United States Army. That's what makes us the best Army. And so I, I, I'm going to kind of close out here with just thanking each and every one of you for what you do for the nation uh, every single day. I could not be more proud of being your Chief of Staff. Um, and let me thank you for that, and let me go ahead and open up for if there's any questions. So thank you all. Good morning, sir. Uh, I'm Sergeant Nunez, Platoon Sergeant ACO, 47th BSB, 2nd Brigade, 82nd Airborne Division. In regards to retention, you say that it's uh, extremely important, and I do agree, sir. Uh, with retention in AR 670-1, when it comes to the new tattoo policy, I would like to pick your brain and maybe ask you a question about what you feel about facial hair, if it's a professional like beard or professional appearance as well, sir. Yes, you want to ask what, about beards and facial and, and, you know, I mean, right, right now, um, you know, first of all, on, on beards and, and facial hairs, you know, we, we've actually done studies on your ability to, um, to seal a mask. And, and just for all those, you know, if, if you go through the study, um, you can't seal a mask, at least the mask we have with facial hair. And we do have religious accommodations. We do mitigate that. But just as a general rule, Again, this is not, you know, a lot, there's a lot of discussion. Some people say, hey, we, you know, we, we allowed people to have beards, uh, you know, during uh, Iraq and Afghanistan because of the way they were operating. We have religious accommodations that, that authorize people to have beards um, in, in, with mitigation. But just for all those, if you're going to go into a, a chemical or biological environment and really do it, do it with real agents, your mask will not seal with facial hair. Okay, so as far as least, you know, as this chief is, we, we are not moving towards that. Doesn't mean it couldn't happen in the future. I can defer to Sergeant Major over there. You know, he, he can take that question. But at least where we're at right now, we are not considering, you know, opening up, you know, uh, to facial hair, you know, as far as beards and those type things uh, for, for all our soldiers. Okay. Sir Doug Morris, appreciate your comments and yeah. uh, coming out here. It's good to see you again. D2. Sure. Uh, could you comment a little bit on the op tempo of our armor brigade combat teams? You've mentioned about, you know, we had three at one point in time in Europe changing out what's potentially going to be in Korea. Could you yeah. just comment on that high op tempo? Thank you, sir. Yeah, the, 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 on, the, you know, on the op tempo uh, with the Army, uh, with the armored brigade combat teams, um, we're trying, to, we're trying to reduce it. You know, as you all know, we got 11 ABCTs, we have five in the guard, that's 16. Um, I argue that if you want to have a good op tempo, about four or five to one on a mission is really where you want to be. Some people say three to one, but with the modernization we're doing and the training we're doing, for those that are doing those type of rotations, you're in a fast spin rotation. So we are, um, we've just made a change um, in Korea. We're actually putting striker into Korea. That's going to take a rotation out of the ABCTs. That's going to reduce the op tempo. Um, you know, we have two ABCTs uh, sitting in Europe right now, and they're going to be there for a while. So, you know, we start to look at the, the op tempo on those ABCTs. Um, and, and I think we're okay as long as we don't get additional uh, requirements. And, and again, the career um, change has really helped us out as far as strikers. The, the units that, quite frankly, have the, the, you know, that I'm worried about the most is our Patriots. Uh, you know, when you take a look at, um, you know, um, deployments and rotations. Um, you know, at one time we had nine Patriot battalions um, deployed, you know, throughout the world. And when you do the math and you go, we got 15, that's, you know, I, I can't even get close to what, what, you know, what the op tempo is on that. So we are very, very concerned about organizations like that. And, and quite frankly, you know, one of the reasons that I want to make sure we keep the end strength up. You know, historically, the Army's been in a lot of pressure to reduce end strength just because of cost and money and everything else. We are not there right now, and that's why, as I take a look at this year, you know, you know we're, we're, we're going to be okay by the end of the year, but if we keep reducing the size of the Army, some sorry, our vice talked about based on the projections, uh, the Army's going to be at least too small for what I think it is, which is going to put too much stress on our forces and so, 
you know, we want to go ahead and retain all the qualified soldiers we have, and we want to recruit to the levels that, that we have done in the past. Good morning, sir. My name yes. is Dan Noble, retired Army. Um, I've heard you mention Project Convergence, uh, well, once today, and I've heard it yesterday. Can you please describe, because I've been out for a few years now, what, from your perspective, what Project Convergence is? Thank yeah, you. that's a great question. I, I, you know, one of the things we're trying to do uh, in, in the Army, quite frankly, and the Joint Force as a whole, is get to the point where we can tie all our sensors and shooters together through some type of integrated battle command system. So really what that comes down to is being able to pass data very, very quickly. And so we started on this campaign of learning, as we call it, call it and, and, and with Project Con Convergence uh, 20. And we brought some of our Army systems out there. And the idea was that we can have different sensors, you know, call them radars, call them F-35s, call them all different types of radars on the battlefield or sensors on the battlefield that can quickly pick up you know, enemy systems and then move them into some type of integrated battle command system, take advantage of, of um, artificial intelligence, take advantage of uh, a, 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 a system that deals with different types of data and then quickly move them to the, the right shooter that can take care of that system and do it very, very quickly. You know, I like to talk about um, decision dominance in overmatch over here. So how do you get that? Well, you start with speed, you start with range, you start with, uh, you start with um, convergence. And so it's great that we have hypersonic missiles that go really fast and they go really far. But if we don't have long range sensing or targeting that can find the target and do it very, very quickly, then our systems don't go that fast. I used to use the example in the 101st Airborne Division, you know, if it took us 10 hours to put together an air assault and we went at, you know, 120 miles an hour when we flew, we we're really only moving at 12 miles an hour because it took us 10 hours to get there. And if it took us 10 hours to get there, we might as well just buy a truck and not have these $35 million helicopters because we move so slow. So what, what Project Convergence is doing is, is bringing together all these systems. So the first year we did was just Army. Uh, last year, we, we did it with a joint force. And this year, uh, we, in, 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 the, in the fall, we're gonna bring in some of our, our um, allies and partners participate, many are gonna observe, and really what it comes down to the secret sauce is how do we pass data very, very quickly? And you know, you know, a good example is um, the, the unmanned aerial system threat. You know, we have some you know, allies and partners shooting Patriot missiles at you know, $100,000 UASs and those type things. That's not a good you know, kind of return on the investment. So we wanna to get to is we have multiple sensors that are layered that can pick up those type systems and then they quickly bring you know, that information into uh, an integrated battle command system and say, okay, in this case, you know, with this system coming in, we could use THAAD, we can use Patriot, we can use IFPIC, we can use lasers, we can use high-powered microwave. We have a bunch of different lethal systems that we can use to engage those type of targets. And so that's what Project Convergence is about. You, you might have heard a term JADC2, Joint All Domain Command and Control. Again, it's, it's getting the whole joint force and then the future is CJADC2, we get the whole combined force that you can move data very, very quickly and that's how you get the lethality that we need on the battlefield. And in, in a lot of exercises, even in, in some of these places, we're, we're learning that, the value of that very, very quickly. Chief, yeah. we're gonna take one more right yeah. here. Uh, good morning, sir. My name is Denny Lewis, retired Army. I uh, want, first of all, thank you for your uh, 41 years of service and leadership to our Army. We really appreciate that. Uh, my question goes back to Ukraine and all the equipment that we're giving them that's coming out of somewhere here in the Army. And I also take a look at the budget and whether we're going to get a continuing resolution. So my question is, what's the impact on readiness 
of our units because of all the equipment we're giving to Ukraine, and when do we expect to be able to get that back and re-outfit our existing uh, out, uh, units? Yeah, the, um, you know, first of all, we, we're running a tab, if you will, and we're very, I'm very conscious about that, and we have, um, so far we've been pretty good. We gotta replenish this stuff, and we're doing it two ways. One is, some of the systems, like, um, you know, maybe, triple sevens, you know, we, we, we may not replace them with towed artillery, we might replace them with high mars, or we might replace them uh, with, with artillery that is, is, is mobile and work those type things. Some of the things like, you know, 113s have been around forever, you know, uh, the guards giving up 113s, we want to replace those one, 113s with like amp Vs, so that's the next model, um, and so we are putting those things together. The ammunition stocks, we're watching very closely, um, it's amazing how much ammunition you can expend when you're in a large-scale combat operation. It's amazing how many stingers, javelins, 155 rounds, you know, um, you know the, the high miles rounds that we're sending over there. We could, we could send a lot more, but we're watching them. We know where our readiness kind of lines are, and we're, we're going through that mitigation. The thing we have to do in the future is, like stingers, we haven't used stingers at, at this rate in years. And so what we're learning, and I think those are in the industry, uh, the organic industrial base is really not, you know, kind of what we had during, you know, Freedom Forge, World War II, where you can go, okay, I need thousands of this stuff by next week. It's not there. And so we're, we're, we're going to have to do some things, I think, for the future uh, where we need to be more innovative. And what, I'll give you an example. Like some of our, you know, missiles take two years to build because there's long lead items we have to do. Well, you know, one of the things we're looking at is do we buy a whole bunch of these long lead items? We may not even buy all the missiles, but you buy enough so if you get in a situation we have to react like we do right now, we can turn these very, very quickly. And we're going to have to do some other things where we're going to have to invest in supply chains that are, um, you know, that we can, that are guaranteed. We're going to have to invest in the organic industrial base so we can produce these systems uh, as fast as we can. But we are watching the readiness piece very, very closely. And, and the intent for us is, you know, every, every round we send, every weapon system, it's got to be replaced. And, and, and we're getting sport in this. And what we want to do is we don't, we don't want to buy, like what I call, we don't want to buy new old stuff. So, you know, I don't want to buy 113s if I can buy AMVs, but I may not be able to turn the AMVs quick enough you know, to, to do that, and we may have to do something in between. Okay? All right. Chief, thanks for being here. Please give General McConville a big round of applause. Thank you all. Yeah.